Well, it's been great the way that God has spoken to us already this morning. He's been speaking to us about our direction, hasn't he? God kind of brought that word. What direction are you facing? What's the focus of your attention? And we're going to press into that a little bit more and think about that a little bit more together. So if you'd like to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from chapter 2, verse 13. It's uh, a letter written in the first century by the Apostle Paul. He's writing to a church that he planted in Thessalonica, and uh, he had to leave. Unfortunately, things got uh, pretty difficult there. He left. He heard back from them. They were doing well, but they were experiencing increasing persecution and difficulty, and there was some confusing, um, dubious teaching that was beginning to, uh, to find its way to them. And so Paul writes with concern in his heart for them that they would uh, be encouraged to stand firm on the truth of the gospel, the things that he has uh, taught them and shared with them about Jesus. So we're going to read from his letter. Now, um, sometimes when we read the Bible, we have to recontextualize it. We have to kind of think, what is it? What did it mean then? We have to draw some principles out and apply them to our own life. And and the Lord helps us in that, and the Spirit is is at work in that. Sometimes we have to do that a little bit less in terms of uh, this recontextualization. And this passage is reasonably straightforward as we we read it. There's great depths in it, but uh, I think also as we read it, you can imagine the, the Apostle Paul writing to us here, speaking to us, and we can get much of the meaning and the goodness from it. So let's read it together. Don't just kind of, uh, I'm not going to read it and then we're going to talk about it, but just hear it as God's word to you this morning. Paul writes to the church, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruit to be saved. Now actually, uh, it's Um, We're about 2,000 years later, so we're slightly later fruits. But nevertheless, he chose you. If you're a believer in Jesus, he chose you to be saved. He goes on, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And we have the letter here before us. Stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. And he goes on, Now, may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Now we're in chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, for the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. Then he finishes, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. This is a, it's a wonderful passage. It's a superb passage. Every word is like a treasure trove. There's riches here. And we could ponder every word, but I want to just kind of anchor this and focus us on this verse 5, this last verse. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And I'm sure we'll draw on some of these other other magnificent words as well as we do so. We're going to look at it in three sections. It seems to me this, uh, this verse can be broken down into three sections. We'll start with this first one. May the Lord direct your hearts. It's kind of an introduction to it and uh, to lead us into where, the, where God is, uh, is taking us this morning and already has spoken to us. May the Lord direct your heart. So what is your heart? What is your heart? It's the center and the seat of your will. It's that place where your, your deepest desires dwell. It's, it's what sets the course of your life. 
It determines what you're aiming at. Maybe you meander a little bit, but what's, where, where's, what direction is your rudder set through the storms and the challenges and the winds that blow in your life? Where, where are you aiming? That comes from your heart. It's what you've decided in your heart that I'm going to go this way, come what may. We have many kind of shorter term, shallower aims, but underneath them all is a direction, a disposition of the heart to do something, to go in a certain way. This is what Paul is talking about here. It's like a compass. Now, I was given this uh, little compass as a, a present a while back. I think I must have talked about a compass or something. I love compasses. They're just these, it's just amazing. Go and ask me where north is. <laughs> it's over there. I, I know. I never know when someone asks me when I haven't got a compass. They say, you know, some people know, don't they? Some people know, wherever they are, they know, well, that's north, I don't know, I haven't got a clue, I have no idea. I always get lost. Whenever I, whenever I go somewhere, whenever I've got to visit someone, or when, when I just get completely lost. If there's a choice of direction in the road, which way to go, I know I'm going to go the wrong way. But even then, I seem to go the wrong way. I kind of try and double think myself, no, I'd, I'd go that way, that must be the way to go. But it switches around, and it turns out that was the right way to go. But this, that's why I love these things so much. That's why I couldn't believe it when, when, they, when these GPS kind of things came out. It's just it's so helpful. Well, I can tell when I've got this, that's north. And I don't know about you, maybe you're in the, in, you know, in the Cub Scouts or the guides or whatever, and we were told to kind of hold it kind of close here, and you kind of point it in the direction you want to go, and it's like 20 paces north, and you'd go 20 paces north in this direction. And you find the treasure. You follow the direction. If you know what is north, what is true north, these things are wonderful, wonderful little things to have a compass on you. And we have one of these in us. It's the heart. We have a compass that sets our direction, the way that we think we want to go, the way that we will to go. You know, I feel like Iron Man, actually. I feel that, that feels quite good. I should have got a glowing compass. I'm sure you can. Don't get me one. I'm sure you can get one of those. But this is what we have in our heart. What's the direction of my life? Each one of you, each I have a direction that I'm determined to go in, come what may. And we orientate ourselves towards it. What's the direction of your life? Where are you focused? Don't, con don't confuse the heart with feelings either. Feelings kind of come and go. The, the heart is, is, is a much more set thing. It is from the heart come words and actions. Feelings fluctuate. But if you want to know where your heart is at, look at your words and actions. What, what direction are you actually going in? What decisions are you making? What words are you saying? What, where, where are you going? That, the, 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 from the, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what the Bible says. So we can, we can tell the direction of our heart, actually, by what we do. It's not, don't look at your feelings to determine your, your heart. What are, what are, which direction have you decided to go in, to focus on, to set your course in life? And Paul is praying here. It's a kind of prayer. It's a kind of blessing. I'm not quite sure, but he's, he's saying, may the Lord direct your heart. And that kind of tells me three things. First of all, it tells me that God is interested in our hearts. May the Lord direct your heart. He cares about your heart. Of course, he cares about our actions and what, he do, what, what we do. But more than that, he wants us to want the right thing. He doesn't want us to just do the right thing. He wants us to want the right thing. He's about a very deep work in our lives. It's about complete sanctification, setting apart for his purposes. He cares about our hearts. He wants us to want the right thing. You may have heard this passage uh, read out at weddings. Um, as uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy but can, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Can you see how God prizes the attitude behind the action? That's what he's about. The attitude behind the action. He's... he's he cares about nothing less than the deep disposition of our will, that it would be pointed in the right direction. The next thing that this first phrase tells me is that our hearts need redirecting. Paul wouldn't have to say this if our hearts were already pointed in the right direction. He says, may the Lord direct your heart, because actually other things direct our hearts. Our hearts can be pointed in the wrong direction. I don't need to tell you how disastrous it would be if I was 
out in the wilds of Norfolk, North Norfolk, and, and this was pointing in the wrong direction. Catastrophic. It can happen to compasses. If you get a big magnet and you put the magnet near the compass, it can change the polarity. It can change the direction that the compass points. Instead of pointing that direction for north, if I got a, if I got a big magnet and I put it here, it would change the magnet in here, and it would start pointing that way. Imagine, if, if, imagine me. I'm running in this direction. I think I'm getting nearer and nearer to my goal, towards the prize, and I'm going 180 degrees in the wrong direction. I'd like to be able to say, off a, well, there aren't any cliffs, are there? But um, I don't know what dangers might befall me. But if I'm going in the wrong direction, it's dangerous. If you're at sea and you're, you're going in the wrong direction, you can, instead of being going into harbor, you can be going towards the rocks. It's important that our heart is taking us in the right direction. And this warns me. It warns you. Your heart can be facing in the wrong direction. It can be miscalibrated. Something could have happened such that the direction is off. It's a warning here. But praise God, it also tells me that the Lord can direct my heart. He can direct your heart. He comes to redirect the direction of our heart, to point in the right direction. May the Lord direct your heart. I mean, this is a, this is a huge deal. We, God can redirect your heart. <laughs> can you, the magnitude, the glory of God that he can do that, that we can be set in one direction, the will, of, the will for our life. And God can come and can move in us in such a way that he redirects that, our very will, and to the core of our being, he can recalibrate to the direction that is right. This is Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. That's the sovereignty of God in all things. A king ruling over his nation. We do this, we do that. God can just work through that to accomplish his purposes, and he can work through our hearts to redirect them to the right way. So that's the first thing. May the Lord direct your heart. So he directs our heart, but what does he direct our heart to? May the Lord redirect your heart. Well, to what? Well, the first thing is to the love of God. May the Lord redirect your heart to the love of God, which is a wonderful expression. It has a breadth to it. It can mean all sorts of things, but First and foremost, it means God's love for us. May the Lord redirect your heart. He's been asking us this morning, where's your direction? Where's your focus? May the Lord redirect your heart to the love of God that you would know how much he loves you. Verse 13, Paul writes, beloved by the Lord. You're a believer in Jesus. You're part of the church. You're beloved by the Lord. That's your identity. That's who you are. Beloved by the Lord. Verse 16, God our Father who loved us, who loved us. This is who you are. If you're a Christian or a follower of Jesus, he loves you. In fact, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know God, he loves you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He loves you. He would redirect your heart to the love of God. But here's a special way that we can know just how God loves us. If you've put your faith in Jesus, if you come to know God, you come to know God as your heavenly father. You come to know his love in this special way where he is your heavenly father. And I wonder if you know how a father loves his children, a good father. How does a good father love his children? He's present with them. God is present with us as a father. He provides for us. He's protecting, establishing, guarding, directing, empowering, imparting, encouraging, comforting, correcting, strengthening, affirming, affectionate towards us, delighting in us. He's our source, our security, and he sends us out as sons and daughters. This is, what it, this is how God our Father loves us, not just like a father, but he is a father to us. He loves you like a father. He loves you as a father. He is your father. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our father. Paul's praying for them and God's will for us, for you, is that you would know your heart would be directed to the love of God for you as your heavenly father. And let it fill your heart up by the Spirit. He loves you. 
cares about it. Where's your direction this morning? What are you looking at? What are you focusing on? Many things will grab our attention like magnets that come near us. And the Lord wants to redirect our attention. This is the direction to face. The love of God for you is your heavenly Father. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know, I don't, who thought of those things at school where you line everybody up and you, the, two, the two captains get to pick their teams? Well, who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> this will mess them up. Why don't we? Well, I don't still do that today. I hope not. It was me and another boy. Um, we, were, we were left there at the end. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't seem to scar me too much. Um, but I wasn't very good at football with too much. <laughs> I couldn't play football, wasn't interested in football, I'd be thinking about something else. I wasn't sure what they were doing, kicking that thing around. But so I was, it was me and this, this other guy left at the end. We weren't chosen. They were lumbered with us. They didn't choose us. We were the last two that were left. And so we, they were lumbered with us. It's not how God loves us. It's not how God loves us. First, he doesn't choose us because we have some special ability or we're particularly good at something. It's not why he chooses us. He doesn't leave us to last, that we're lumbered with him. Oh, maybe you're thinking, well, God chooses these other Christians, but me, I kind of, um, he's lumbered with me. I kind of come as a, as a job lot. Not at all. He looks at you. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know for a fact that he looked at you. Before you were born, in fact, he thought you, he brought you together with Christ in his mind, and he chose you purposely, you. He wasn't lumbered with you. He chose you out of love for you. Why? Because of his great grace. He just chose you. I love you, you. He called you to himself through the gospel. And you believed. And he worked by his spirit to sanctify you, to purify you, and set you apart for his purposes. It was his direct, decisive, thought about choice to choose you. He wasn't lumbered with you. It might feel good to be chosen because you're, you're good at football or you're, I don't know, maybe you've got some special ability. That can feel good for a while until you mess up or until your ability fades, or until somebody else comes along that's better, and it all gets a bit bitter. But when you're chosen out of sheer love and grace, that will never change. Well, that's a wonderful way to be loved. What incredible security comes from that. And Paul would direct their hearts, and God would direct our hearts to this love, the love of a father who chose you, who adopted you into his family. When you were far away, when you were facing the other direction, he came and he changed the disposition of your heart by revealing his love to you. And your heart and mine was, was one again, faced in the right direction. From facing away from God, it was changed to facing to God. This is the wonderful, lavish, lavish grace of God to us. God wasn't lumbered with you. He chose you. He chose you to be his. And when, of course, God loves us in this way, we, we, we love him back. Love fills our heart for him. When you see what kind of God he is and what kind of way he's loved us, we love him. And this love then spills out to, from us to others around us. But I want to finish now looking at this last thing, a particular aspect of God's love that Paul wants their heart to be directed to. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and, and what? And what specifically? What is at the heart of this love that he would direct our hearts to? May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And to the steadfastness of Christ. Steadfastness is the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. It's patience, it's endurance, it's fortitude, it's perseverance, it's stickability. It's keep on going and never stopping. This is how God loves us. Keeps on going, never stopping. Jesus supremely exhibited this kind of love on the cross when he died for our sin, for your sin and mine. He stuck it out. The steadfastness of Christ. And as I was thinking this through, I was thinking Jesus came determined to do this. He, he loved us. God loved us. And so Jesus came into, the, into this world to do this, to die for our sin. And right at the start of his public ministry, along came the temptation, along came Satan. and said, look, I can give you glory. You can, you can rule over this, this world, but just bow before me. There's another way that you could go. 
that doesn't involve this pain that's ahead of you? Jesus said no. He said no. He was steadfast. He continued to do what he came to do. Scroll forward a few years, and there's Judas about to leave as, it's in, uh, as they celebrate the Passover. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He didn't say, Judas, stop, don't go. He said, Judas, what you're going to do, do it quickly. He was steadfast. He could have stopped it. He could have said, guys, grab Judas. He's going to betray us. He could have rugby tackled him on the way out. He remained steadfast on the Mount of Olives. He's praying. He's the, the terror of what was before him, what was to come, bearing the sin of the world, a kind of a physical manifestation of that, we kind of see it, is it's the crucifixion. Jesus knew what was coming. He prayed, dro- sweats of blood dropped from him as sweat. He could have run, he could have, he could have hid, but he didn't. He stayed there. He remained steadfast. He knew what he had, came, what he had come to do. And then, of course, Judas turns up with the, the temple guards. Jesus could have run. And there's, was it, Peter takes out his sword, one of them takes out his sword. They could have fought back. Jesus says, no, this is what I've come for. This is what I've come to do. He remains steadfast. He said, I'm going to do it. He was arrested. He didn't flee. He went with him. He remained steadfast. He was tried. He was falsely accused. He didn't open his mouth to defend himself. He remained steadfast. Before Pilate, Pilate didn't want to crucify him. That is, no, he wanted to give Jesus a way out. He was handing it to Jesus on a plate. Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm going to go through with this. He said, do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. For how then would scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? It must happen this way. This is the only way that your sin and mine will be dealt with, that Jesus would die on the cross for us, bearing the sin of the world. It must happen this way. As the flagrum, the kind of Roman whip, tore into his body, tore flesh off his body, he remained steadfast. He could have called down at any moment legion of angels. It could have stopped. As the nails were, were bashed into his hands, as he was stretched out, he remained steadfast. This is the love of God for you and for me. This is what the Lord would redirect our hearts to this morning. As he hung there, body racked with pain, Every breath difficult, he remained steadfast out of love for you and out of love for for me until it was finished. It was done. He remained steadfast to the end. This is the love of God for us. And Paul writes to them. He prays for them. He says, let let the love of, let let, let your hearts be, be, be changed by the love of God because they were experiencing difficulty and challenge and getting kind of thrown off in all kinds of ways. He writes similarly another letter to uh, the Hebrews. He says to them, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Consider Jesus and how he loved you and how he was steadfast for you. And in that knowledge, stand firm yourself. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, as Jesus had. And have you forgotten the exhortation that dresses you as sons? Remember who you are, sons and daughters of God, loved by him with such a steadfast love. Now you, in response to this love, stand firm. Stand firm. Love the Lord in this way with this same steadfast love. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. And God would say to us, and through Paul's words, he would encourage us, if you're facing temptation today, to turn away from Jesus, to face in a different direction, to go in a different direction. Consider the steadfastness of Christ for you and stand firm. Maybe temptation pulling out your heart like hooks dragging you in this direction. The lies seeming so trustworthy. My life would be so good. It would feel so good. Everything would go good if I went in this direction. It's the wrong direction. It's away from the Lord. Fix your eyes on the steadfastness of Christ for you on the cross and stick at it. Follow Jesus. Put one foot after the other. Take each day. Receive his grace. Stand firm. Maybe sharing the gospel with a, with a friend just seems, and seems difficult. Your heart wants to kind of do something else. Maybe some aspect of serving in the church is becoming difficult and costly. Maybe caring for a loved one is difficult. and You feel like you're at the end of your resources. 
Consider him who endured such opposition for you, who bore your sin on his shoulders, and stand firm as the love of God fills and floods your heart. Stand firm and out of love for him and love for those around you. Keep following Jesus. Let the direction of your heart be set on God through the gospel in Jesus. We're going to break bread together now. And uh, let me see if I can get this up here. Oh, thank you so much. This is a wonderful way to... Uh, is it, oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> you know, I was looking at that. Thank you so much. I was looking at that earlier. Actually, I didn't, I didn't think I'd, I'd try it on my own because um, I know how heavy they are, but thank you so much. This is a wonderful way to let our hearts be recalibrated. We're not going to rush this. We're going to take the bread and wine together. If you're a follower of Jesus, we're going to take the bread and wine together and we're going to let the, the direction of our heart line up with God's love for us. Because you know, you know the bread speaks of Jesus' body broken for us. Jesus' body broken for us. And as we take it in just a moment, it's not, a, it's not just an external action. My pr- prayer is, and I believe the direction of God's word this morning to us, is that our very hearts would be lined up and focused on the love of God for us. And it would set the direction of our lives for, forever, for eternity, through this life and into eternity. That it would be fixed and focused on the love of God for us and the steadfastness of Christ. So why don't we take this bread, take uh, the bread that you've got there. Jesus' body was broken for you. This is how much he loves you. He cares about you. Let the love of God flood your heart now as you eat this bread. Maybe for the first time, you're, you're turning from sin. You're the, the, the direction of your heart is wonderfully turning from sin and self to faith in Jesus, to the love of God for you. This is a work of the Spirit. No, it's not a human work. This is something that God does as he sanctifies you, as he sets you apart from your very heart for him and for his purposes. And Holy Spirit, we ask that right across this place, as we now eat this bread, Lord, you'd be changing hearts Lord, you don't just care about actions, but hearts, the action, behind, the attitude behind the action. We thank you, Jesus, that you died for us in our place, revealing the love of God for us. God, line up our hearts to this. Fill and flood our hearts with this knowledge in Jesus' name. Turn to him. Turn to Christ in faith. Turn from sin. As the Lord moves in us, as he directs our hearts, we respond in faith and belief. We make decisions. It's an indication of the Lord working in our hearts in these ways. Now let's take the wine, take the juice, and let's turn our attention to the steadfastness of Christ, the stickability of Christ. This is the kind of love with which he loved us, that he would stay there on the cross for you and for me as he bore your sin. Let his love flood your heart and love him in return. Lord Jesus, the rest of my life, for the rest of our lives, we want to be going in the right direction. We thank you for recalibrating us. Maybe some a little bit off, maybe some way off. Maybe you were 180 degrees off when you came in here this morning. And Lord, has redirect your heart to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. And now the steps that you're taking now will be in a different direction. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to love you with all our heart and soul and might. This is your greatest commandment. This is what you want, that we would love you with our whole heart, with everything in us. Father, we thank you so much for changing our heart's disposition. We pray you would continue to do that as we focus our eyes on you and worship now. Why don't we stand together? Just a wonderful way to begin to express the decisions we've made in our heart, to express how the Lord has worked in our heart even now as we've listened this morning and taken the bread and the wine together. Let's express that in song, even as we'll walk through the rest of the week, expressing it in our words and our actions. Father, we want to say we love you. 
We declare you, Lord Jesus, as Lord and Saviour. We thank you for this great gospel proclamation that comes and changes hearts. We thank you for changing hearts among us today. We pray as we make this declaration with our words and actions through the week that you would be changing hearts of those around us. What a Saviour. What a Father we have. Holy Spirit, come and direct our hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ for your glory. Amen.